Lying in bed next to the best wife a man can have, I recalled the day with a smile. I went to a job I loved and came home to the best family in the world. I played tag in the backyard with my two wonderful kids, ate some delicious food, and watched a baseball game on TV with my family. After the kids went to bed, my wife of 21 years, and I enjoyed some satisfying, loving romp in the bedroom. We hooged and kissed several times in a rush of bliss before my wife drifted off to sleep and rolled over onto her side, away from me. I grabbed her with my left hand and smiled inwardly. Yes, there was nothing special about me, and I didn't do anything special during the day. I was a boring guy, living a life that most people would probably consider boring. How great it was. Unfortunately, I did not know that this day would be my last. I got a call a little before noon. Carrie was crying, almost hysterical, and it was difficult for me to understand her. If I understood her correctly, she was saying something about our son, Troy, kidney disease, and the hospital. I told her I would meet her there in 20 minutes. I quickly explained everything to my boss and rushed out the door. Eighteen minutes later and somehow without missing a beat, I was at the hospital, talking one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Michael Fierstos in the emergency room of the hospital where my son had been admitted less than an hour earlier, doubled over in pain. How he went from being a normal, healthy high school freshman to having stage 3 chronic kidney disease is a mystery to the doctor, who told me a specialist was coming to examine my son. Carrie and I tried our best to look optimistic in front of our son, but it wasn't easy. Carrie quickly googled chronic kidney disease on her phone, and I just sat by the bed with Troy, cracking jokes and goofing around. Carrie stood to the side and read, swallowing back tears and turning pale as she continued to read. Several times she looked up from the phone, and we made eye contact, and then I realized that this was not good for our son. After 45 minutes, this was confirmed by specialist Dr. Brendan Nicholas. He told us that Troy urgently needed a kidney transplant if he was going to survive to graduate high school, even with dialysis. For a 14-year-old, Troy took the news very well, immediately bursting into tears. I can't say I blamed him. Carrie joined him a second later. Dr. Nicholas explained to us that Although kidney transplants are quite common these days, finding a suitable candidate is still difficult. According to him, the best and probably easiest thing would be to find relatives. But the problem is that I was an only child in the family, and Carrie only had one sibling who had two minor children who were not entitled to donation, like Troy's 17-year-old sister. Including four living grandparents, there were only seven possible donors in the family. They were all tested and ruled out within a week. To say our family was devastated would be an understatement. However, our doctors were more optimistic than we were. Or at least, they acted that way. However, things weren't looking good for Troy. There were many tears shed in the hospital and at the Nowak home in the week after the seven of us were removed from the list. One of my favorite lines from a TV show of all time is from Monty Python's Flying Circus. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. To twist the phrase a little, no one expects a miracle. But that's exactly what we seem to have gotten, about a week later, from an unlikely source half a world away. Carrie called Sergio Santiago, an 18-year-old boy, the son of two of our good friends, Jorge and Robbie Santiago, nephew, because we are very close to the Santiago family, but technically we were not related, as far as I know, until it turned out that we, or at least Carrie and him, were, and he was a third-party transplant for our Troy. As we said before, Mr. Novak, a family match is the best, and a half-sibling is almost as good as a full brother or sister, Dr. Nicholas enthused. But Doc, he's not a stepbrother. Oh, damn. Oh, shit, I muttered, looking at Dr. Nicholas in horror. My brain stopped working at full capacity for a split second until it came back on. At first, everything I heard was a miracle for Troy. Then all I heard was the end of my marriage as I knew it. I looked at Carrie, who seemed to be trying to disappear right before my eyes. Car, baby, 
Oh, damn, baby, I whispered. She looked away, but I saw that her face and neck were very red. I froze in place, waiting for her to say something. Five seconds passed, then ten. I cleared my throat. I can't worry about anything but Troy right now, she said. I called. I had to try, for Troy's sake. Thank you for thinking about someone else this time, I replied in an emotionless voice. I hope that a miracle happened for us because we no longer had a marriage. For the first time in several minutes, she looked directly at me and narrowed her eyes. Not now, Josh. I do not have time for this. I heard what she was saying, and I knew... Whatever it takes. How long will it take them to get here? I asked. They will be here in a week, starting Thursday, she said quietly. Fine. They can stay with us as usual, I replied. Over the years, Santiago has stayed with us about half a dozen times. Our basement was converted into a full guest suite with a master bedroom, a smaller bedroom, and a full bath. It wasn't exactly the five-star hotel the Santiago's usually stayed at, but then again, they were family. Family. Yes, exactly. Carrie and Robbie were roommates at Iowa State University for the past two years. Robbie and Jorge were already a couple by the time I started dating Carrie before Christmas, my freshman year. It took me a while to develop a relationship with Jorge. He was the son of a wealthy Spanish businessman and was something of a rich playboy idiot. However, I realized that he is essentially a good guy without a single evil bone in his body, and his goofiness is largely due to the fact that he did not live in the real world until he came to the United States for college. We ended up developing a pretty good friendship, although a lot of it was still centered around the women in our lives. They were best friends as well as roommates, and there were even rumors around campus that they were more than just friends. But I've never seen any evidence of this. Jorge and Robbie got married six months after we all graduated from university. Carrie was a bridesmaid, and I attended the wedding as a guest. Six months after that, Robbie was Carrie's bridesmaid at our wedding in Champaign, Illinois. And of course, Jorge was there too. I can't even begin to describe how busy our lives suddenly became. In addition to the fact that Troy required dialysis every day, there seemed to be legions of doctors and nurses around him at all times. There was a lot to take into account. The operation, post-operative care, all the necessary medications, and psychological aspects. And for an adult, this would be too much, but for a 14-year-old teenager, it seemed incomprehensible. Troy was scared, and I didn't blame him. He was an athletic, fairly strong child with a quick mind. It seemed like nothing could throw him off balance until this happened. Suddenly, he felt very bad and in pain. My heart ached because I couldn't do anything to stop the pain. I knew that Carrie was suffering for our son as much as I was, so I let the elephant graze in the room for now. I spent the next week working half days. At least it gave me something positive to focus on other than my son and my wife's cheating. Lord, how I tried to push this to the back of my mind, but no matter how hard I tried, Troy's illness was like a blow to my heart. Carrie's affair was a low blow. Work was the only part of my life that didn't bring me pain. Over the next few days, Carrie and I were rarely alone. In those rare moments when we were alone at home, our daughter Anjali, or AJ for short, was with us so we could not speak freely, even if we wanted to. When we were alone in the bedroom at night, it was strictly for sleeping. Fatigue can be a beautiful thing. Under normal circumstances, Santiago's arrival would have created a party-like atmosphere in the house. There were the usual hugs, excluding me, but it was a low-key group. I must admit, I stood back and watched with mixed feelings, anger and nausea among them. Several minutes passed before Robbie noticed me. She blushed and lowered her eyes for a couple of seconds and then came up to me and hugged me tightly. I'm so sorry, Josh. Honestly? She whispered in my ear before releasing me from her embrace. I nodded silently as she walked away. Looking up, I noticed that everyone was looking at me. Neither Troy nor AJ were told about their biological connection to Sergio. They both decided that the coincidence between Sergio and Troy was simply an incredible coincidence. We four adults decided not to say anything for now. However, Sergio, as I found out, knew about this connection for approximately the last four years. 
Carrie said he agreed with his parents' explanation of events. It seemed like everyone who knew had a good understanding of what was going on. Maybe someday, when I understand everything, I will also understand it well, although I seriously doubted it. Once everyone was settled, Carrie left for the hospital with Santiago so they could visit Troy. AJ and I stayed home. She waited until Carrie's SUV was out of the driveway and then walked over to me. What's going on, Dad? She asked. I'm not an idiot. There's definitely something going on between you and Mom, and it has something to do with Aunt Robbie and Uncle Jorge. If you don't tell me, I'll just ask Sergio. I'm sure he knows and will tell me. He tells me everything. There are pros and cons to having really smart kids. One of the disadvantages is that it is difficult to hide things from him or her. AJ was a very smart child. I decided it would be best if I told her, even if I didn't know the whole story. This way she will know the whole story without the hype that I was sure would come from my wife. I told her what I had found out, which, to be honest, wasn't much. Her mother cheated on me with Jorge Santiago while I was on a long business trip, and they had a child, Sergio, who was also her half-brother. For her, and for Troy. That's why Sergio was such a good transplant for Troy. Wow, she said almost in a whisper. Wait! You didn't know about this until Troy got sick, did you? That's why you've been looking at your mom so strangely for the last week or so. I nodded my head affirmatively. I'm sure I blushed. At that moment, I felt like the biggest idiot in the world. But I was wrong, because there was more to it. So you also didn't know that mom shared a bedroom with Aunt Robbie and Uncle Jorge when we visited them in Spain all those years? They didn't stop doing this until I was 12 years old. Mom always said they did it because she and Aunt Robbie were like sisters, and you knew it. My mouth dropped open in absolute shock. I was speechless. I don't think I needed to answer this question. Oh my God. Sorry, Daddy. She breathed. I always thought it was a little strange, but I was just a child. She said, you know. I believed her. Damn. I croaked. What are you going to do? She asked, again switching to a whisper. Right now? Nothing. We have to survive Troy's operation. Then we'll discuss everything. In great detail, I'm sure, I said. I, we, would appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone anything before our conversation. Yes, okay, Dad, she said. I'll cover for you, Dad. Thank you, baby, I replied. I admit that I was reserved around my wife and Santiago. I noticed that my wife, Robbie, and George were looking at me a lot, and they seemed to spend a lot of time whispering to each other. On Friday evening, returning to the house, Sergio quietly called me aside. Can we talk? Just you and me, Uncle Josh? Is it important? He asked. How can I refuse you, Sergio? You're the one saving my son and your half-brother, I said quietly as his eyebrows rose. Sergio and I took a walk around our neighborhood. Look, Uncle Josh, I know this is all terrible and awkward. I'm glad I can be around Troy, he said. But I want... No, I need to ask you for a favor. About a favor between us that I think I've earned the right to ask for. I want to ask you not to divorce Aunt Carrie because of this and not to take physical revenge on my father, Sergio said. There was concern in his eyes. I looked, no, studied his handsome face. He looked most like Georgie. But now that I knew what I was looking for, I saw a little of my wife in him. Come to think of it, he actually looked like he could be Troy's brother. How did I not notice this before? I can't promise that I'll stay with my wife after Troy leaves for college, but I can promise not to take physical revenge on your father. That's all I can do, Sergio even with everything you do for me, and, I think, for yourself, too, I said. So, how do you feel about all this, Sergio? How do you feel about Aunt Carrie and being Troy's half-brother? I asked. To be honest, I was a little scared when they first told me about it, he replied. But I wouldn't be here if Dad and Aunt Carrie hadn't agreed to get together to give my parents a baby. Mom is my mother in my mind, and Aunt Carrie is still Aunt Carrie although now I probably have even more feelings for her in my heart. 
and I always looked at Troy as a little brother. I think it's great that he's my brother, and I'm really glad I can help him. We walked the rest of the way home in silence. It gave me even more to think about. I didn't understand much from this whole story, but I realized that it was even worse than I thought. The transplant was done the following Tuesday. Five very tense people waited for several hours. Both boys came out of the surgery in good shape. Troy's new kidney started working right away, which was a very good sign, the doctors told us. That evening, five very tired people left the hospital. I didn't think much of it when Robbie volunteered to go with me to my favorite Chinese restaurant for the takeout we ordered two days after our transplant. We barely had time to get onto the road when she started apologizing. In the 40 minutes it took to get to the restaurant and back, I learned the whole story. When we got home, I definitely didn't feel like eating. I served in the Naval Reserve for 20 years and deployed overseas three times. The first trip was about a year after Carrie and I got married. I was sent to the Middle East for 18 months. In order not to be alone, Carrie went to Robbie and Jorge for the entire duration of my service. I know it shouldn't have happened, but it did. I'm sorry, Josh, she began. One night we were having a lot of fun and ended up in the same bed, and that gave me an idea, which turned out to be the stupidest thing I've ever had. I haven't told anyone except Carrie, but I can't have children, and I really, really wanted them. So I thought she could get pregnant with Jorge and have a baby, and I could adopt him and raise him, and you'd never have to know about it. And the plan worked perfectly. She gave birth to a beautiful boy. By the time you returned home six months later, Carrie had lost almost all the weight, and we just told you that she had gained a little weight from eating our rich food, and you probably wouldn't have known it. And you wouldn't have known if Troy hadn't gotten sick. Robbie lowered her head and blushed slightly. I waited for the continuation but never heard anything. However, remembering my daughter's words, I realized that there was actually more to it than that. For several seconds, I stared at her. I talked to AJ, I said, leaving the rest up to Robbie. Oh, she practically whispered. She didn't just have sex with him once. I'm not stupid, even if I didn't know some of the rest, I said sharply. No, they did this a lot before she had the baby. And since then, they have continued to do this for many years. Right before my eyes, they became more than just good friends. They became lovers. I didn't expect this to happen. By that time, I had only one option, to come to terms with the situation. I had my child and I love Georgie and Carrie, so I decided to be a part of what they had rather than send them both away. Your two business trips, your two weeks every year, other vacations when they came without you. Then, when Carrie decided that AJ was old enough to understand that something was happening, they began to go somewhere together, and the children stayed with me and Sergio. Don't be mad, Josh. We all got something from this deal. I got my son Georgie and Carrie spent some time together and your son got a new kidney. That's not how I look at it, Robbie, I said. The kidney was an accident. I look at it like everyone got something except me. I was simply removed from the equation. I was not involved in the deal with you three. I did not agree for my wife to become pregnant and carry a child for you. I didn't consent to my wife having an affair for 19 years. Although now that I think about it, maybe I was the one having an affair with Carrie. Maybe I was her second man. He was her first love, and I was a minor character. You may have accepted the fact that you only have a piece of your husband's heart, but I will not accept the fact that I only have a piece of my wife's heart. I'm an all-or-nothing guy, Robbie. You should know this about me. My wife definitely must have known this about me. So what are we all going to do next, Josh? She asked. I don't know, but I promised Sergio that I would stay with Carrie at least while Troy lived at home, and not hurt your husband, I said. How could you and Horg do this to me? I thought we were friends. Hell, just family. Family doesn't do that to each other, Robbie. We pulled into the driveway and the conversation ended there. Both boys were released from the hospital and returned home within a week. Modern medicine is simply amazing. If nothing unexpected happens, Troy will live a long and normal life and so will Sergio. The elephant remained quietly in the room until the evening, 
when the Santiago's were ready to fly home. I agreed that AJ would stay with the boys in the family room and watch some zombie show while eating pizza and drinking soda. The adults went with me to my home office, where in addition to the desk, there was a sofa and a couple of armchairs. I grabbed a couple bottles of wine and bought a selection of deli meats from a local store. When I walked into the room, it didn't escape my notice that Carrie and Jorge were sitting together on the couch and Robbie was alone in the chair. I placed everything on the coffee table and pulled a chair towards me. As everyone filled their plates, I began the discussion by once again praising Sergio for agreeing so readily and what it said about how Robbie and Jorge raised him. Carrie supported my statement, and I know Sergio's parents must be bursting with pride. Still, what can I say other than the fact that I'm incredibly angry at both of you, I said, looking around at the couple on the couch. If I hadn't made that promise to Sergio, you both could be dead right now. How could the man who was supposed to love me more than anyone in the world do this to me? Chatting on me multiple times and secretly having a child with another man? Continue dating your lover for the next 18 years. Yes, now I know about this too. Damn, you did this practically in front of my children. Carrie looked like she wanted to respond, but apparently changed her mind. I just figured it out. Oh shit, I whispered. You two have been having fun with each other ever since you showed up here again. How many times? Once? Twice? Every damn day? She lowered her head and did not answer. I looked at Jorge, then at Robbie. Only twice, as far as I know, Robbie finally answered. Damn it, woman, I muttered. Tell me what's not in our bed. Carrie didn't look up from the floor. Now I understand, Carrie. I'm slow, so it took me a while. You may love me, you may, but you're in love with him. He's number one. I'm number two, just like Robbie is to Jorge. Tell me I'm wrong. There might as well be crickets chirping here. I finished my glass of wine and poured myself another. I offered to pour another for the other three in the room, but they all silently refused. I really love you, Josh. I never took anything from you. I never left you for him. We only met when you were unavailable, Carrie said to finally break the silence. This is cool, baby. You took away my trust, loyalty, and devotion, I said. I also don't remember our vows giving either of us a hall pass unless our spouses were available, which 19 years ago meant I was a lieutenant firing and sweating my ass off in the Middle East. While I was losing a couple of friends, you were sunbathing in the south of Spain when you weren't in bed, entertaining these two, getting pregnant with his child, and then giving birth to his child. We don't even need to talk about all the other times you two were together. At least at some point you realized that you should be less open with our children and started sleeping with him away from our or their home. Except, apparently, this week. The three other people in the room sat in silence, mostly interested in something on the floor. Miracle of miracles, however, you had a spare son to help Troy. I continued with sarcasm. I'm sure exposing yourself was the last thing you wanted to do, so I at least appreciate it. Finally, an act of self-sacrifice from the most selfish woman. Robbie was sobbing. Jorge looked guilty. Carrie's gaze wavered between guilt and fear, with a little tinge of anger when I called her selfish. So where do we go now, Josh? I don't want to get a divorce, Carrie began. Since I promised your first son, and I don't break my promises and vows, you have four years before I divorce you. It will happen when Troy leaves for college, but we won't talk about it in front of him, I said. However, it will be you who will tell him that Sergio is his half-brother, and this should happen in the near future. I will be in the room when you tell him about this, and I will make sure that you tell him a sad story about a woman who cheated on her husband, and not a love story about a woman who had a wonderful affair. I have no doubt that he will be very happy to have Sergio as a brother, because they are already so close. I know AJ was very happy about it, once she got over her anger at your bad attitude towards me. Does she know the whole story? Carrie asked in a strangled voice. What exactly did you tell her? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, now it's already hurt. I grinned sadly. I didn't tell her anything. 
She's a smart kid and has been able to figure things out over the years, although I know there are some holes in her knowledge that you should probably fill in. She didn't necessarily know everything, but she kind of knew everything. You know what I'm saying? But because she wasn't completely sure of it, and because of the lies you told her, she never came to me and gave you up. She only told me what she knew and what she suspected when I asked her directly. She felt very guilty for not coming to me. Our son, on the other hand, still doesn't know anything. The blissful ignorance of youth and trust in his parents. And of course, you know that Sergio has known for years that you two cuckolded me. Several times over the past few years, I have noticed a strange look in his eyes and wondered about it. Now I know it was a look of pity. It's wonderful when a teenager looks at you with pity because he knows that his father and your wife are making a mockery of your marriage. Everyone got something from this deal, except me. I was simply crossed out. That's not true, Josh. I love you, she cried. I was a good wife and mother. If it weren't for this story with the kidneys, you would still be happy and not understand anything. Why can't we at least go back to the happy part? I never refused you sex. So you're saying that I should be happy being your number two option just because I didn't know what was going on? I was always supposed to be your number one and there weren't supposed to be any other numbers. Please tell me if I was ever your number one, I asked. She blushed again. She stammered. At the beginning, when we first got married, before I moved in with Robbie and Jorge, she said. So you're saying that when we made love, you weren't thinking about Horish? How could you give birth to two children for me if you were in love with another man? Ah, uh, I thought you deserved to have children of your own. I love you, remember? She said. Exactly. Right. How could I forget about this? Hmm, I said. At the very least, judging by your actions, I can assume that you love our children as much as you love your child with him. She made a face at me, then looked at Robbie and Jorge. If she was looking for verbal support, it did not come. We should be discussing this in private and not dragging Robbie and Jorge into our problem, Carrie said scornfully. Are you kidding me? Robbie and Jorge started this problem, I shouted. All three turned pale at my outburst. They all looked a little nervous. Okay, you all know that I made a promise to Sergio, and I intend to keep it. But I want a promise from you, Carrie. I want you to at least be faithful to me until Troy leaves for college. That means no more trips to Spain without me, and no more visits to Santiago while I'm serving my two weeks in the reserves. Faithful means faithful. If you break this promise, I will break my promise to Sergio and file for divorce immediately. Is it clear? Robbie smiled, and Carrie and Jorge sat with their mouths agape and speechless. I appreciated that Robbie apparently understood everything, because it is possible that the promise would have helped her too. The two lovers stared at each other for about a minute before Carrie quietly answered in the affirmative, while nodding her head slightly. That's better. Wine anyone else? I asked. After the Santiago's left for Spain, I moved into a bedroom in the guest room in the basement. Carrie and I slept together in our bed while the Santiago's were with us, but we hadn't had sex since we found out Troy was sick. It worked to my advantage after I found out about my wife and Jorge. Don't be a child, Josh. We had sex so many times over all these years while I slept with Jorge, and you didn't know about it, she quipped to me. That's right, Carrie, I growled back. I did not know. Now that I know what you shared with another man, I no longer feel the same feelings. Carrie looked like she had sucked a bag of lemons. I got the feeling that she had no idea how this was going to happen. Modern medicine is amazing. Six months after surgery, Troy was back to his old self, joking and acting like a normal schoolboy. Yes, he constantly had to take medication to combat transplant rejection, and he couldn't play football. But in almost every other way, he got his life back. I felt it was time for him to find out the truth about his relationship with Sergio. Carrie and I discussed this for several days. She was in favor of leaving everything as it was, hoping that Troy would eventually figure things out on his own. Seriously, that's exactly what she told me. Nice try, baby. But you have to explain everything to him, just like I told you months ago. 
and let's have a full family meeting so AJ can hear it straight from her mother's mouth, I said. She sighed loudly, but eventually nodded in agreement. Troy turned 15, a couple of months ago, and I have to admit, I didn't always understand what was going on in his head. I had to laugh at this because I remembered when I was 15, and I didn't always understand what was going on in my dad's head either. I knew this conversation wouldn't be easy. I hoped Carrie understood this too. Watching from his lazy boy chair, Troy seemed to take the news that he's Sergio's half-brother, well, which is what I expected, because he already loves Sergio like a brother. However, the how question turned out to be more difficult. Wait, did you have sex with Uncle Jorge? But you were married to Dad then, weren't you? That makes you a traitor, he shouted. Don't you dare call... Carrie started screaming back at our son until I grabbed her hand and squeezed it, forcing her to quickly close her mouth. She fell silent and sat there, ashamed. The silence in the room lasted for several seconds. Yes, perhaps the correct term would be slutty, I said. But that's not your concern. That's mine. I didn't know about this until you got sick. Your mother called Santiago and asked Sergio to take a test hoping that he would be a candidate for a kidney transplant. She practically threw herself under the bus trying to save you, so the least you can do is show gratitude and restraint. Troy lowered his head as I chastised him. He was confused and offended. I understood this perfectly. If anyone should be upset, it should be me. And believe me, I'm upset. But this is a problem between me and my mother, which we must solve. We'll get through this somehow. I won't leave you guys. I have no such intention. That's why I moved into the basement, I said. I could see that AJ wanted to get involved. I shook my head slightly at her and she leaned back on the couch she was sitting on. I quickly glanced at Carrie, who was sitting next to her, looking like the roof of our house was about to collapse on her. A few months later, AJ left for Central Michigan University. Troy asked if he could go with her. I know it seemed like a joke, but when I looked at his face, I realized that he was completely serious. In the house with my son, Carrie and I were at least polite to each other. We did all the normal parenting things like attend his school events. It seemed to me that at that time, we were a completely believable, loving couple. Although I could see how our pretense was straining my wife. But I didn't care. I was going to live my life and enjoy being a father to my son. It also bothered my wife that we lived separately at home. There was no touching, no loving phrases, no little jokes, and definitely no intimacy. She couldn't just turn over and start doing things in bed at night because I wasn't there for her, literally. The latter was also not easy for me, but her infidelity somewhat dulled my libido. Uh, Josh, can't we at least go back to being us physically? I mean, we've always had a pretty good sex life. I never refused you anything, you know. Can't we at least get back to this? I know you're human and you have to have needs. Carrie pleaded with me one evening about three months later while Troy was out with friends. I looked her up and down. She was still a beautiful woman with a good body. It would literally just be sex because I wasn't in love with her anymore. Although I still loved her, this feeling gradually faded away. It will be sex, pure and simple, not lovemaking. I will get mine, and she will get hers. I didn't plan to work for her benefit. I guess so, but you'll have to go down to my room. Knowing what I know now, you have abused our marital bed many times over the years, and there is no way I will make out with you in that bed again, I croaked. Yes. Okay, I understand. I'll come to you in a few minutes. I just need to clean myself up a little, she said. Getting Carrie ready included applying a little makeup and perfume, quickly styling her hair, and putting on my favorite lace teddy under her robe. Entering my room, she took off her robe and twirled around in it. I had to quickly imagine her with Jorge to keep my excitement under control. I rolled off Carrie and lay on his back, enjoying his personal aftertaste. Once upon a time, I would have enjoyed the afterglow with Carrie in my arms, I really regretted that those days were gone forever. When I heard Carrie sobbing next to me, I knew she probably knew what I was thinking. 
I resisted the temptation to hug her and calm her down. After a few minutes, she stood up, threw on her teddy and robe, and quietly went back upstairs. There were no discussions, no pillow talk, just silence. When I went upstairs to watch TV in the family room, I heard the shower running in the master bathroom. I was sitting in gym shorts and a t-shirt when Troy got home. It was clear that something was gnawing at him. Dad, you haven't taken Mom to a restaurant, club, or anywhere else for several months now, he said. Are you ever going to forgive her and become a real couple again? Moment of truth, I guess. I reflected a little on what was in my heart and head before answering. He waited patiently while I figured out how to phrase my answer. Troy, I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive her enough to go back to what we had, or what I thought we had. It was all a sham. It was a lie. Your mother is in love with Uncle Shorhe, and I'm just her backup plan. Now that I have realized this fact, how can I go back to it? Football teams have backup quarterbacks, but marriages don't have backup husbands, I said. I'm sorry, son, but what we have now is probably the best we have left. Troy looked shocked, but I think he understood. He went to his bedroom. Carrie understood, too. Every few weeks, she asked for some personal time, which became code for sex. I suppose she could have been secretly having sex with someone else, but she knew that if she got caught, whatever happened next would be entirely on her. I don't know if Carrie felt the significance of Troy's graduation as much as I did. Once upon a time, probably, yes. But I have long since stopped worrying about what she does and what worries her. I didn't love her anymore. I still cared about her. We had a shared history and two wonderful children, but her years of deception had dulled my feelings to the bare minimum. I have always believed that hate is the polar opposite of love. I have learned from my own experience that the opposite of love is indifference. Who knew? I remember heading off to college with 10 days worth of clothes, 14 pairs of underwear, and a stereo system. Troy went to the University of Oregon with 14 days worth of clothing, 14 pairs of underwear, an iPad, laptop, cell phone, headphones, and two boxes of other stuff. Yes, things have definitely changed. Troy was really excited and chatted for most of the two-day trip. Hell, it was basically a 16-hour monologue. I don't think Carrie managed to get more than two words in, and I didn't say more than that. I don't think Troy even realized that he was pretty much the only one talking for two days. Since Troy stayed in Eugene, the car ride home was incredibly quiet. I drove the car for about 12 of the 16 hours. Carrie was the chief navigator, which also meant she was in charge of most of the music. If I hear a Michael Bolton ballad one more time in my life, well, I knew that Carrie was feeling incredibly melancholy when both children practically left home. Don't forget, I said Carrie was a good mother, and I knew she loved the children much more than she loved me. I may not have been her favorite man, but AJ and Troy were on her list of favorite children. I could tell by how gloomy she was that she wasn't looking at the big picture. I thought I would feel better when Carrie was handed an envelope right after we pulled into our driveway. She grabbed the envelope as if it were radioactive, burst into tears, and ran into the house. I felt small. When I made plans for the post-trip period, I was working on pure revenge. Looking back, I realized it was just petty. I know I need help. I also knew that we were done as a married couple from the moment I found out about her infidelity. I kept my promise to Sergio. I told him I would stay with Carrie until Troy left for college. I gave her two extra days. I was lying in my room when I heard her knock on the door. The door was unlocked, so I told her to come in. Do you hate me that much now, Josh? She asked quietly. Did I destroy everything? Yes, you ruined everything, but I don't hate you, Carrie. I just don't care about you now, I said. But we had something good for many years until you found out, she argued. Is it true? It was all a lie to me after you left for Robbie and Jorge the first time. You no longer loved only me as you promised. She no longer gave her body to me alone, as she had promised. You gave birth to a child from another man. Why couldn't you just be honest with me after you fell in love with Jorge? Why couldn't you just divorce me? You stayed with me and gave me two wonderful children. But you deceived me for 18 years. You robbed me of 18 years where I could have been looking for a woman to share my life with instead of wasting those 18 years being a selfish woman's second choice. 
Go back to Jorge, Carrie. Can't you see it? I'm setting you free. But I loved you, Josh. Can't you see it? I couldn't stay with you for 20 years if I didn't love you. Yes, I'm not in love with you like I am with Jorge, but I really love you, she cried. Your version of love is different from mine, Carrie. If you really loved me, you would have done right by me and not kept me as a backup boyfriend. I should have been number one. I deserve to be the desired guy you were in love with. By deceiving me, you never gave me a choice between being number two or finding a woman who wanted me to be number one. You gave me two wonderful children. We had a good life, or at least it seemed so to me. Everything disappeared in smoke. You apparently got what you wanted. Jorge apparently got what he wanted. Robbie got what she wanted. And what I got was, I got crap. So what was your plan after the kids left home, assuming I never found out about you and Jorge? Her mouth opened, but no sound came out, at least for a few seconds. I guess I always thought that I would return to Spain to be with Jorge and Robbie. Sorry, Josh. I guess I never considered you in my long-term plans, she said quietly. I know, I answered just as quietly. I won't fight anything in the divorce, she practically whispered. I was surprised that both children were unhappy with my decision to divorce their mother. Initially, they were both upset that she had cheated on me for so long but I think she was able to convince them that her love for me was real. As for her love for Jorge, well, it went on for so long that they were able to rationalize it to themselves. Apparently, they were also able to rationalize in their minds that I would be happy to be their mother's number two guy. Aunt Robbie is good about it. Why can't you go along with it like she does? AJ asked. Aunt Robbie helped organize it all. She, Uncle Jorge, and your mom were making plans. I was not included in them. Everyone but me was involved in all this. Why wasn't I included in the plans? Because your mother knew I wouldn't agree. It's better to ask for forgiveness. If you have to, than to ask permission, I said. Let me ask you something, AJ. When you get married, will you allow your husband to have a mistress? A mistress that he will care about more than you? No. I would kick his ass if he even suggested that, she said firmly. But at the moment, this has been going on for more than 20 years. So I should just get over it because it takes forever? How's Aunt Robbie? What would you do if this happened to you? She winced and lowered her eyes. The conversation was apparently over. My assumption that Carrie would go to Spain after the divorce was confirmed by my children. I admit... I missed communication, but not the life that I had, because I never had it. Realizing that I no longer trusted women, I went to a psychologist and got help. However, I wasn't exactly looking for a new relationship. I went on a few dates, and even sometimes, very sometimes, had sex, but it was no longer top of my list. I was surprised by the fact that among women between the ages of 40 and 50, there seemed to be a lot of singles. I guess I was never aware of this fact when I was a supposedly happily married man. I also didn't understand how the dynamics between men and women had changed over the last 20 odd years. The last time I was free in the dating scene, it was mostly men doing the hunting. Today I learned that it's a 50-50 proposition. It took me a minute or two to get used to the new dynamic. I have to admit, it really boosts my ego when a woman comes up to me to start dancing. This was probably the last face I expected to see when I opened the door one day, about two years after the divorce. It took a couple of seconds to realize who I was looking at, even though she looked almost the same as the last time I saw her. Robbie Santiago was still a beautiful woman. Um, come in, Robbie. What brings you to my door? I asked, still in some shock. Can't I visit an old friend? If we're still friends, I guess, she answered timidly. She accepted the cup of coffee I offered, and we sat down in my family room. She shifted in her seat and cleared her throat. You still haven't answered my question, Josh. Are we still friends? She asked. I wrinkled my face, thinking. We used to be friends. At least I thought so. Then I found out that you don't think so. 
I began to say until she intervened. No, that's not true, she interrupted. I always considered you a friend. If I were a friend, how could you treat me the way you did? I asked. I was selfish and incredibly stupid, Robbie said. I never seriously thought about the consequences of my actions because I trusted Yorhi and Carrie. Carrie was like a sister to me. I never foresaw that things would turn out this way. I accepted it because I managed to get Sergio out of this deal. And after that, for all these years, it was just a few days here and there. And I really liked that you forbade her to see him for those few years. But then you divorced her and sent her back into his life and mine. I think after all these years, I'm tired of being his second best woman. Now I completely understand what you were talking about. God, I was such a fool. It hurts, doesn't it? I asked smugly. She didn't answer, just lowered her eyes. Finally, someone showed remorse. I think we can become friends in a way again. Friends bound by shared experiences, I said. We talked until late at night. We moved on from coffee to a bottle of Pinot Grigio and finished it off. As she turned to leave, I surprised her, and myself, by offering her my guest room. She agreed. Frankly, it was funny, getting a piece of my old life back. I think we both enjoyed this meeting. The second weekend she stayed with me, we went out to a restaurant for dinner and then went to an upscale bar for drinks and dessert. It was two old friends, not a date, but somewhere along the way, hormones got involved. She was wearing a rather tight navy blue dress, showing off more than a hint of cleavage and muscular toned legs. I certainly didn't plan for anything to happen, so I was a little surprised when I felt myself getting an erection while we were eating dessert. I blushed, and she just understood. She reached across the table and took my hand. We continued to hold hands for the rest of the evening. We were probably a block from my house when Robbie changed the game. It doesn't have to mean anything, Josh, she croaked. You're a handsome single guy, and I'm in an open marriage. We are consenting adults. I smiled widely. I reached for her hand, found it, and kissed it. Clothes started falling to the floor almost as soon as we got back to my house, like something out of one of those romantic movies. As we walked towards my bedroom, I discovered that Robbie's kissing skills were top-notch. When we got to my bedroom, I carefully laid her down on the bed. Her breathing became uneven and then ragged. She started shouting something in Spanish. I knew she was bilingual after living in Spain for so many years, but since I had only been to their house a few times, my Spanish was pretty poor. In English. Say it in English, baby. How can I tell if you like something or not if you speak a language I barely know? I said. I gradually moved to the side so as not to hurt her with my weight. She smiled softly as I looked into her eyes. I won't lie and say that it was the best sex I've ever had, although it was the best since I found out about Carrie's infidelity several years ago. We did it again that night and again in the morning. We showered together and happily washed each other's bodies before I took her to IHOP for a great breakfast. We spent most of the day on the couch in the family room, cuddling, kissing, and watching TV. She did not return to sleep in the guest room for the rest of her stay with me, which lasted another three weeks. I need to go back to Spain and divorce Jorge and then decide what I want to do with the rest of my life, Robbie said. I know we had fun together, but we both know we're not right for each other in the long run. And yet you're a damn good person, Josh. I'm really sorry that I started to ruin your marriage. You didn't force her to do what she did, and at least you showed remorse. That's more than with Carrie, I said. Well, I hope you find someone who appreciates you for everything you bring, which is a lot, Robbie said. Carrie had been living with Jorge for five years, and my children moved to the south of Spain to be closer to their mother. I miss them, but not their attitude. I'm tired of apologizing for divorcing their mother because she cheated on me. No one was more surprised than I was when Troy called at six in the morning one Sunday morning. Yeah, who the hell calls someone on a Sunday at six in the morning? I didn't bother to look who was calling. I just grabbed the phone and screamed. What? This better be a fucking emergency or someone is going to die, I shouted. Dad, Dad, it's me, Troy. Why are you so angry? He asked. It's six in the morning on Sunday, Troy. Have you forgotten about the time difference? I asked. 
Uh, yes, I think so, Dad, he said quietly. I'll call you back later. No, Troy, don't hang up. What do you need? I asked. Uh, I'm not sure how to say this, Dad, but here's the thing. Did you know that AJ is sleeping with Uncle Jorge? He announced, rather than asked. At this point, I had about three hours of sleep after a very late night with a girl young enough to be dating. My son. But that was a whole other story. By the time he finished his statement, I was already awake. What? What the hell did you just say? I shouted into the phone. You heard me, Dad. I said AJ is sleeping with Uncle Jorge. He announced again. How did you know that? I asked, still at full volume. We were all at Uncle Jorge's, AJ, Sergio, and me, and when it got late, all the kids went to their bedrooms, leaving only Uncle Jorge and Mom. In the middle of the night, I was woken up by a woman's scream, and I realized that it was not my mother. I stood up and walked to AJ's door and listened for a while because I was sure that I would have to kill Sergio. For God's sake, he's her half-brother. But then it got worse. It wasn't Sergio, he said. You are sure? I wheezed. Yes, he whispered. Well, she's already 27, Dad. I think she can decide who she sleeps with. But still, it's just creepy, you know what I mean? And your mother doesn't mind? I asked. He hesitated. I'm not sure she knows about it, he said. Two days later, I stood on the threshold of Jorge's house and waited for the answer to the call at the luxurious door. The woman in the house opened the door, gasping. Josh, what are you doing here? Carrie asked with a very shocked look on her face. I was nearby and wanted to see my children. Do you have problems with this? I asked rudely. She stepped aside and let me inside. Why didn't you call? You could have stayed here if we knew you were coming, she said. I glared at her as all three kids and Jorge entered the salon. Seeing that it was me, all three children went to hug each other, but Jorge stayed away. The children all started talking at once but quickly fell silent when I approached Jorge with fire in my eyes. He raised both hands in surrender. It didn't matter. I'm not the best fighter, but I can take care of myself. In this case, there was rage on my side. I threw my best straight punch with my right hand, which went through his raised arms and landed right on his nose. I felt the bone crunch and blood gushed in all directions. He backed away and I punched him in the stomach twice as hard as I could, once with each hand. I stepped back, breathing heavily, and looked around at the shocked faces. Uncle Josh, you promised me that you wouldn't hurt Dad for what he did to Aunt Carrie. Sergio howled but wisely remained in place. I breathed fire from my nostrils as I watched Jorge wince in pain as Carrie rushed towards him. I didn't break my promise to you, I shouted back. He received these beatings for touching my daughter, your half-sister. Did you know that he had sex with your daughter? I asked, turning my attention to my ex-wife. Her expression changed from scared to shocked as she looked at me and then back at Jorge. What is he talking about? She asked Jorge. Jorge was curled up in a ball, bleeding profusely and whimpering. I'm old enough to decide who I sleep with, AJ said. I don't need permission from any of you. Yes, you are old enough to make your own mistakes, like sharing a man with your mother, even if it is the man who ruined your parents' marriage. But you, like your mother and the asshole on the floor, are also old enough to understand that every action has consequences and his recent action gave me the chance to give him the consequences that I could not give him for, that he entertained your mother because I promised Sergio. I think I should thank you for giving me a chance to do something that should have been done a long time ago. But still, your choice of sexual partners is more than a little troubling, given everything that's happened. She blushed, looking first at me, then at her mother. Sorry, Mom, she said. Carrie looked at AJ intently, and I knew what was about to happen. She turned to Jorge and swung her leg as hard as she could, hitting the man in the face. He groaned and lost consciousness. Nice shot, Mom, Troy admired. Sorry, Uncle Josh. I didn't know about Dad and AJ. It's just wrong, Sergio said. Yes, Sergio, but it's not your fault and it's not your place to apologize, I said. 
kids, it was great seeing you all. Although you and I, AJ, have a lot to talk about sometimes. Carrie, it wasn't very nice to see you, but I need to see some sights for a few days before I return home. Now, if you don't mind. Oh, by the way, you have my number if that idiot wants to press charges against me. Just call me and I'll give up. That won't happen, Uncle Josh. This is my promise. Dad and I also have something to talk about, Sergio said. Everyone screams when they land after their first skydive, and I was no exception. It was simply amazing. My toes touched the ground first, and since my legs were extended in front of my body, I landed carefully on my butt and screamed. I quickly jumped to my knees and then to my feet and ran back to grab the parachute. My pulse was racing. I was too nervous to look at my Fitbit, otherwise I might see incredible numbers. It felt like my chest was going to explode. My heart was beating so hard and fast, and I knew that my smile was splitting my face in two. Yes, yes, yes! I screamed again as the jump master came up to me to congratulate me and check if I had hurt myself in any way. Great jump, Josh, he told me enthusiastically as I collected my equipment and headed towards the exit of the landing zone. As I walked toward the garage where people were coming out to greet me, I realized that I was sweating profusely, and it seemed to me that all the sounds around me had become a little louder, a little more distinct. Maybe this is what happens during near-death experiences, I thought to myself. Okay, okay, I know I went a little overboard, maybe even a half, but after witnessing the birth of my two children, I just experienced the most amazing thing of my life better than marriage. Even better than my first sex. I will probably never be able to explain exactly what I just experienced. I was 51 years old and had been divorced for several years. For several years after the divorce, I was practically vegetating, but a recent trip to Spain gave my life a boost. More precisely, beating Jorge Santiago did wonders for my mood. The first day after returning to the States, I practically jumped out of bed. I laced up my New Balance sneakers and hit the road. Over the past year, I have returned to jogging, but getting back into shape has been difficult. That morning, I practically skipped work. I was almost unbearable. I felt so energized. My receptionist, Teresa, noticed this immediately, and five minutes after I walked in, she showed up at my door with a cup of coffee and a notepad, because I had a lot to catch up on after being away for a week, at least according to her. The ruse ended after a minute when she sat up, looked me straight in the eyes and said, Okay, spit it out. You spent a week in Spain having sex, didn't you? Even better, Teresa, I replied. I found my style. Who knew he was on holiday in the south of Spain? That's great, Josh. I'm happy for you. You deserved it. I signed up for a couple of classes at a small local college just for fun. There are over a billion Chinese people in China, and I decided that I needed to understand the culture a little better. The second course was even more frivolous. It was dedicated to classic rock. Most of the people in the class were my age, but there were a few kids who were probably forced to listen to their parents' music growing up and got hooked. A month later, I decided that I needed to skydive. I don't know why this stuck in my head because I'm deathly afraid of heights. I just felt like I needed to do something to overcome this fear, and jumping out of a plane from 2,000 feet seemed absolutely fucking ridiculous. Maybe that's the downside of living alone. There's no one who can tell you that a stupid fucking idea is just that. A stupid fucking idea. Think about it. Why would anyone voluntarily jump out of a perfectly functional airplane? So I actually signed up for the classes needed to start jumping. I thought the class was good, but everything changed when we put on our suits, broke into groups of three, and my group went to the converted four-seater plane we were going to jump from. In short, I'm glad I didn't have a weak heart. Otherwise, it might have been a dead body floating toward the ground, but it was an amazing experience, and I'm glad I did it. At least once. A few of us newbies were hanging around after the jumps and sort of celebrating together, drinking Cokes and making fun of each other about our style, or rather lack thereof. I was on my second Coke and eating M&Ms from the machine when a screaming girl walked into the garage, obviously still as worked up as the rest of us, but a few inches shorter and a few octaves taller. She barely managed to remove the helmet, 
but when she did, curly blonde hair came out first, which eventually straightened out, revealing large lavender blue eyes and a smile that looked like it came out of a dental office advertisement. For the second time that day, I was afraid that my heart would stop. I almost choked on my candy when she took off her overalls. It was a warm day, and she wore a tight T-shirt and very tight jeans. She looked to be about 30, although I later learned that she was 44. I also later learned that her name was Evie Abraham. Maybe because she was so petite, she seemed even more animated than the others, and I couldn't take my eyes off her as we all sat around the table talking about our experiences. I finally realized I was staring and hoped I wasn't drooling. I hoped I was unnoticed when I looked to see if she had a ring on her left hand. Did not have. After that, we talked for some time, until Evie got up from the table and walked towards the parking lot. I wasted no time getting up and following her. I left the airfield that day with memories to last a lifetime and a date set for the following Saturday evening. On our first date, I took her to a Chinese restaurant, and she spent the first ten minutes at the table chatting uncontrollably about her first jump. I completely understood her, since we had a common experience. Later, we moved on to our personal lives. I told her about my ex-wife and my two children, and she told her about her late husband and her two children. She was widowed at 34 when a drunk driver killed her husband in a car accident, leaving her to raise her two children alone. She became very quiet after telling me her story. I saw tears welling up in her eyes, but she tried very hard not to let them fall. After the first year of his absence, I promised myself that I would no longer mourn myself, she explained. I know I cried for myself, feeling sorry for myself and the children, but that's not what Dan would have wanted. He was one of those who said, stop crying. It's time to move forward and move on with life. That's what I did. We will never forget Dan, but we will honor his memory every day as we move forward and live a good life. I was depressed when she finished. I didn't tell her, but I've shed many tears over the years over the loss of my wife. It looks like he's a smart person since he was able to give advice to someone he didn't even know, I said quietly. She tilted her head to the right and smiled widely. I learned that this is one of her signs when she likes something. Because she had to be both a mother and a father to her children, she became a bit of a tomboy in her early thirties. She learned to throw baseballs and soccer balls accurately and boasted that she could balance on hockey skates with a stick in her hand. Although she didn't play sports growing up, she learned to be a supportive parent to two athletic kids, and that meant she learned everything there was to know about different sports, including how to care for the various cuts and scrapes she got children. I can put a butterfly on cuts like no one else, and I can ice my body like a pro, she says proudly. Armed with this information, I took her to a Cincinnati Reds baseball game on our second date. She took the program from me, turned to the scorecard, and began counting up the points for the game. Damn, most guys I know can't keep score, but this babe did it like a pro. I was very impressed. My son played baseball, and my daughter played softball. I became the official stat guy for both teams, she said, using air quotes for guy. She was five feet tall, restless, and full of enthusiasm. She favored tight t-shirts, jeans, and sneakers, and gradually fit into my world as easily as she fit under my arm when I held her close to me. At the end of our first date, I received a chaste kiss on the cheek. I then received gentle kisses on the lips several times during our second date. After that, the kissing became more intense, but I never felt like it was the right time to pursue a relationship with her until we ended our sixth date. And she made a move. Am I not doing this for you, Josh? She asked as we kissed on the couch in her living room. I mean, you've never laid a finger on me yet. And I really want something more from you than just a finger, she said, tilting her head to the right and smiling. I felt myself blushing. I suddenly felt like I was back in high school again. It's been a long time for me. No, not for this, I said, looking up and seeing Evie grinning like a Cheshire cat. I think we could have something special. And I guess I'm afraid I might ruin it, I replied as my heart pounded in my ears. Oh, honey, that won't happen at least not from me.
Now how about you show me how quickly you can get naked? She said, her eyes sparkling. Six months later, we got engaged, and six months after that, we had a small wedding, which was attended only by her two children, my son and Sergio. AJ, although invited, decided not to come because I had not invited her new husband, Jorge, whom Carrie divorced almost immediately after she found out he was sleeping with her daughter. No wonder we didn't go to Spain on our honeymoon. 